So uh, these last few weeks comprise mainly of Jesus' final uh, moments with His uh, apostles and His close friends. And of course a lot of uh, commentators refer to this period of time that He spends with His disciples at the very end, uh, you know, His suffering and death, they refer to all of this time period as the Passion. So when I talk about His Passion, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm referring to a, um, you know, a particular time frame in Jesus' final moments or final days. Now before John describes the Passion, He's also going to give us a view of how different individuals and groups react to Jesus' great miracle in raising Lazarus from the dead. Last time we talked about how people reacted to Lazarus' death, uh, right? So now what happens is we're going to see how people reacted to Lazarus' resurrection. Very interesting uh, ideas. So let's, let's start with um, with Mary, well John, of course, starts with Mary, the sister of Lazarus and uh, the sister of Martha. Let's read chapter 12, beginning in verse one. John writes, Jesus therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped His feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So we know that it was Jesus' custom to stay with His friends, Lazarus and Mary and Martha in Bethany. They only lived a few miles from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and He'd stay with them when He would travel to Jerusalem uh, for various feasts and in order to preach and teach. Uh, his own home was about 80 miles north in Capernaum, maybe a little more than that, near the uh, Red Sea. Now the Passover was the most important and best attended feast in the Jewish calendar, but Jesus uh, was not there for only these reasons. Uh, he knew it was His appointed time and He was there because of this. So he, you know, he, he, he didn't just go to the feast because it was a big feast. He knew that now was his particular time for the passion, if you wish, to begin. So Martha, true to her nature, was organizing the supper, this time no complaining. And Lazarus, a walking miracle, a witness was at the table. Imagine, the people had gone to this guy's funeral. <laughs> it's just like when we have a, you know, we organize a, a potluck for a funeral uh, for the family. Can you imagine going to the funeral and then coming back to the church building for the potluck and the guy who was in the coffin is sitting at one of the tables enjoying, hey, I'll have some more chicken. You know, I mean, it was pretty unnerving, I think. So there's Lazarus, the guy who had been dead and mourned for, sitting in his own house with Jesus, uh, enjoying the meal. Now, in Matthew and Mark's account of this particular episode, they mention that Mary anointed the head of Jesus. John here merely adds the fact that she also anointed His feet as well. Now, the wiping of His feet uh, with her hair is significant in that a woman of that culture would not display her hair in public, and certainly not to a group of men, because there were only uh, men at the supper because men and women did not recline uh, to eat in mixed company. So only men were at this table, highly unusual for a woman to come in and to let down her hair. Uh, her action, of course, demonstrated that she was laying her honor at her master's feet. The complete use of expensive ointment, nard, uh, nard is the plant from India that provides the essence for the perfume, and the way, that it was, you know, the way that it was done was a perfect act of humility and devotion and honor to her Lord. Humility uh, in that her head was at the Lord's feet. Devotion 
in that all of the ointment was used. You know, she gave all of it, she didn't hold any of it back. And honor in that Jesus was the total focus of this action. She didn't anoint the feet of other people. She didn't anoint Lazarus' feet, for example. He, you know, he was the miracle boy at that time. So Mary's reaction demonstrated her faith in Jesus, not as a friend or a teacher, but rather Jesus, the divine Lord, toward whom she directed her worship and her love. It wasn't just an act of gratitude. You, know, you saved my brother, I'm doing this. Having the meal, this could have been an act of gratitude. But what she did was an act of, an act of worship. And so this was Mary's reaction to the resurrection of her brother. She went and performed this act of worship and devotion uh, to the Lord. Uh, let's look at uh, Judas Iscariot, because John describes his particular reaction. Go to verse four. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, uh, who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this, not because he was concerned uh, about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put uh, into it. Uh, therefore Jesus said, let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. So Judas you know, could have objected on several grounds legitimately. Uh, he could have said, well, such a show was a little too lavish for a prophet of God, or it was too showy for a simple rabbi from Galilee. He could have said that. Or he could have remarked that it was improper for a woman to be so forward in mixed company. He could have said that. That could have been a you know, kind of a legit uh, complaint. There might have been legitimate complaints if Jesus were an ordinary man, if he was just a rabbi. But Judas, revealing his nature, zeroes in on the value of the ointment and he complains about the waste that this action caused. You know, the perfume was worth several months of wages in those days. If you want to know, you know how expensive it was, well, it was worth a couple of months salary. That's how expensive it was. So his accusation is that Jesus is wasting money on self-glorification instead of taking care of the poor. That's his accusation. And of course the base of it is he didn't believe that he's the son of God. Of course if Jesus is only a man, well you know yeah this might have been a little too much if he's only a man. And uh, some people you know they wonder well are we being too hard on Judas? No, not at all. He didn't believe despite the fact that he was an eyewitness to the teaching and the miracles he didn't really uh, believe. So John uh, in an editorial comment reveals the true motivation behind um, Judas's comment and that's greed and dishonesty which blinded him from seeing the truth before his uh, very eyes. You know, Jesus sat with the resurrected Lazarus and he still continued in his evil ways even now accusing Jesus of sin and waste. Imagine that. He accuses Jesus in front of all these people after this great miracle. So Judas's reaction to Lazarus's resurrection was a hard, hard heart. He, he swept away this chance to change his mind by continuing to reinforce his sinful ways. And John says, you know, he was a thief and he continued being a thief. So Jesus you know, doesn't let his accusations slip by. He defends Mary's actions in consideration of several reasons. He doesn't, let, you know, he doesn't say anything about the insult to himself, but he does defend what Mary has done. He tells you know, her faith and devotion were well placed in him. He is special and this was a worthy act. The poor, he says, are always there and this was not the only resource that they had. I mean, they had helped in the past, they would do so in the future, but for now this was the best thing they could do with what they had to honor Him. This was the right and best thing that they could do. And of course, His death was at hand, and this action provided a, an opportunity to refer to it as well as to prepare for it. He was also preparing for His passion, right? 
So Jesus in His response provides a, a, a rebuke to Judas and a commendation to Mary. Again, He doesn't let it slip by. He doesn't defend Himself. You know, he doesn't say, hey, wait a minute, I'm the Son of God. You know, he doesn't say anything about Himself. He only protects, he only protects Mary. All right, so that's Judas's reaction. We have Mary's reaction, an act of worship, an act of devotion and faith. We have Judas's reaction to Lazarus' resurrection, which was a hard heart, refusal to believe. Um, uh, John then looks at the Jewish leaders in verses 9 to 11. It says, the large crowd of the Jews then learned that He was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but, they might, uh, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom He raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Man, do you believe these guys? I mean, they not only want to kill the guy who did the miracle, they also want to kill the guy, uh, you know, the recipient of the miracle. I mean, the situation is now critical for these Jewish leaders because it's becoming evident that they are on the wrong side of the fence. You ever, you know, have you ever been in that situation? You've been you know, really hollering and yelling for something and then all of, it, all of a sudden it dawns on you, oh, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Maybe, may, maybe the other person has a point here. So Lazarus' resurrection has kind of electrified the people and the word has spread. So the leaders are in charge in principle, but they're quickly losing control of their authority over the people. So their plot to arrest and kill Jesus now includes Lazarus because he's causing as much of a stir as Jesus because of what's happened to him. So how do the leaders react? Well, the leaders react with the same disbelief and fear that they have consistently shown from the very beginning. Nothing's different, nothing's new, except now they're resolved to take action against Jesus. In other words, no turning back. So it's like when you're having this debate or you're having this argument with your wife or husband or friend, whatever, and realize all of a sudden hey, wait a minute, I, I think I might be wrong on this one, and she might be right. You, know, you, have, to, you have to decide, what am I going to do? You know, swallow my pride and say, you know what, I think maybe you do have a point here. Maybe you're right, maybe I need to reconsider. You know, I, I see a lot of people shaking their heads. Okay, well, that's for, that's for marriage counseling class. <laughs> So the leaders, they react with disbelief uh, and fear. Now they're afraid for their, for their position. John next looks at the multitudes, verses 12 to 19, what their reaction was. He says, on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet Him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're not going to do any good. Look, the world has gone after him. So um, after the miracle in Bethany and you know, the word of it spreading, a large crowd forms around Jesus and accompanies him to Jerusalem. A lot of times you know, we read about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and we forget to hook the events together. He raises Lazarus from the dead. That just is like a bomb that goes off and people are excited. And then the next day or in the following time period is His triumphal entry. And so one is fueling the other. The momentum is really uh, building here. So the people are blessing and praising His name. They're bringing Him into the city as a king, a victorious uh, leader. 
The words they use are phrases from different psalms which uh, indicate their belief in Him as the Messiah. And the palm tree branches represented life and salvation to the Jews. Riding on a donkey was a direct fulfillment of the prophecy uh, in Zechariah chapter 9 uh, verse 9 concerning the manner that the Messiah would enter the city. The prophet said this is how the Messiah would enter the city and so Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy. Jesus came in meekness and grace riding on a donkey. Uh, why a donkey? Well it's the type of animal. It's not a horse, you know, a king. You know, the Jews in their mind the Messiah was going to be a king a leader, a triumphal, you know, powerful individual, probably coming in on a horse, because you know, kings, they rode horses, they rode chariots, they didn't ride donkeys, but Jesus comes in on a donkey, a, a much uh, more humble um, approach. So John notes that after his resurrection, the apostles would realize the prophetic importance and the rightness of this particular moment. Probably they're caught up in the excitement too. They're not putting two and two together here. So John also writes that the miraculous raising of Lazarus is what galvanized his followers for the triumphant and enthusiastic entry into the city. And John uses the comments of the Pharisees who were watching helplessly. I mean, they say that the whole world, meaning their world, has gone over to Jesus for the moment and there was nothing they can do about it. We're beaten. He's outflanked us. How can we deal with this? I mean, he's raising people from the dead. How are we going to compete with that? And so uh, John next, uh, really interesting, he gives us the reaction of Gentiles who were there. So let's read about that. It says, now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. After Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Well, <clears throat> there was only one thing worse for the Jewish leaders than having the people go over to Jesus and losing their position. There was only one thing worse than that that could happen, and that was if non-Jews were also allowed to follow Jesus and both groups became one. And this was the danger here. This was the scenario they were seeing beginning to unfold. So this passage makes a, a kind of a faint allusion to this idea. It'll only happen in the future once the gospel is preached beyond Judea. And Paul, of course, the apostle, is charged with bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Here we just get a little preview of it, just a little, just a little snippet of it. But, but, but Jesus is kind of showing what's to come in the future. Now Jesus sets the stage for this event here. Now the Greeks were Gentile converts allowed to participate in the feast and in the worship, but only from the outer court of the Gentiles. Remember I showed you that picture once of the, the courts? The Gentiles were in the outer court. Uh, those who had converted, if you wish, proselyte, uh, proselytes who were converting to Judaism, even if they converted to the religion, they never were able to get beyond that court. They couldn't go to the next court where the Jewish males were and the females were, okay? So Jesus was probably in the court of men, separated from the court of the Gentiles, and they, knowing Philip, requested that he come to them for a personal meeting. They couldn't go inside the court of men, but Jesus could leave the court of men and come into the court of the Gentiles to meet with them. So Philip confers with Andrew, Andrew's in the inner circle, perhaps because of the trouble this might cause. Jesus you know, speaking with Gentiles in the area of the temple, that could be a problem. I mean, he, he could go if he wanted to, but that might cause a bit of a stir, a bit of a riot. So they finally pass on the request to Jesus, who responds not by meeting with them, 
but by making a general declaration that will affect them far into the future. That's why you know, I used to read this passage and say, he's, he's gotten a request from these Gentiles and yet he answers something that seems to have nothing to do with what they've just asked him for. But there is a connection. He uses the request to declare two events. First of all, the beginning of his passion was at hand. He uses their request to announce the beginning of his passion. His suffering and death and resurrection was going to happen soon, not next year or next decade, but now. This showed in advance that he knew it, he declared it, and he accepted it. He was, he was the grain of wheat. He's talking about himself. A lot of times you know, we take this passage and we, we, we say, well, Jesus is saying this to his disciples. Well, yes, he is, but in the first instance, he's talking about himself. He's the grain of wheat sown into the ground of death who had produced a great harvest of souls. So first he's referring to himself. And then the second thing he declares is this, those who would follow him would need to make a difficult choice. This life, this world, or the life and the world to come. No halfway measures, not one or the other, uh, I mean not one or the other, and, and you lived accordingly. Now, these declarations were good news for the Greeks who had asked for a private meeting. They asked for a private meeting, and instead of the private meeting, Jesus says publicly, not privately, and here's the, here's the key here. He says that anyone, not just Jews, he says anyone who wanted to serve him could do so by following him. He's talking over the head of the Jews to these Gentiles. And he's saying to them basically, my passion, my cross, my resurrection is at hand. I'm the grain of wheat that's going to fall and bring a great harvest. And anyone, that includes you Gentiles, anyone who wants a part of me, who wants the reward that I offer, can have it. That was, that was great news to them. So the Greeks, they reacted with a desire for access to Jesus. And what does the Lord do? He offers them and all who would follow Him, Jew or Greek, the opportunity to have full access, not only to Himself, but to the Father on an eternal basis. So they, they show their faith in Him and He rewards their faith by telling them in the very near future, you will have even better access to God than the Jews have here in the temple. No more walls separating you, no more divisions, Jew, Gentile. Everyone who follows me will be an equal disciple. And so in verse 27 to 50, this whole passage here, the cycle continues. Those are the five people. John shifts gears at this point and he reverts back to the familiar cycle where Jesus makes a declaration and then there's a certain reaction of belief or disbelief. So let's read um, verse 27. It says, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, we have, heard, uh, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, for a little while longer the light is among you. Walk like you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though they had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and He has hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw His glory and spoke of Him. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in Him but because of the Pharisees they were not confessing Him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Kind of a long passage here. We have several voices mixed in. All right. Remember I told you at the beginning, this is most of John is just a dialogue between Jesus and different people, and we see evidence of that right here. So a couple of voices that we hear in this section. First, Jesus declares that the hour, meaning the time of His death, is at hand, and that He will both fulfill His reason for being here and be glorified. In other words, He'll be honored by what happens. He will, in other words, demonstrate who He really is. He also declares that by this death He will defeat Satan. In other words, He's going to take away Satan's power to condemn mankind because of their sins. There will now be forgiveness of sin and satisfaction of the breaking of the law. His cross. You know, it's sometimes a little difficult to understand, you know, how does Jesus take away Satan's power? Well, here's Satan's power. Imagine, if you wish, there's a hammer over you. And, and what's holding the hammer is you know, uh, obedience. So what Satan does is he seduces men to sin. And when they sin, it's like taking away that, the obedience and the hammer falls on you and kills you. That's the power Satan has. He has the power of the law. He knows that if we sin, Boom, the hammer comes down and we're dead. We're condemned. So what he does, he doesn't bring the hammer down. He seduces us to break the law. And when we break the law, ping, the hammer comes down. That's his power. So Jesus takes away his power. How? He, he sets up a permanent thing here that keeps the hammer from falling. And that's called forgiveness. Okay? It's forgiveness. So we still failed, we still are imperfect, we still sin, but that hammer doesn't come down. Why? Because God, Jesus Christ, through His death and resurrection, has established a way for us to be forgiven for those sins. Okay? Kind of a simplistic imagery, but I think it works. That's how He takes Satan's power away, and that's what Jesus is saying this. And He says, because of this, He will draw all mankind to Himself through this action. The preaching of the gospel to all the world will point all mankind to the cross of salvation. And he encourages them to believe while the time for faith is ripe. So he speaks uh, to, um, he, first of all, his own voice. He says, hey, now, now this is going to happen. The thing that I came to do is going to happen. The second voice uh, is the Father. You hear God the Father confirm what Jesus has just declared by revealing Himself in a voice. Now He's done this before at the Jesus' baptism, at the transfiguration, and He does so again to the multitudes as a witness of Jesus' declaration. I mean, think about it now. He, you know, in the last week or so, Jesus has resurrected Lazarus from the dead. There's one miracle. Now He declares, I'm going to die, I'm going to resurrect. He declares what He's going to do, and they hear a voice from heaven confirming this. Now watch, the third voice, the voice of the multitudes. These are the same ones who were praising Him as He entered the city. Same people, now they're beginning to doubt. They don't like the idea of a tortured or dead Messiah. They interpret the scripture to mean that the Messiah will never die. That's why they say, wait a minute, you know, the Bible says the Messiah is never going to die. What do you mean you're going to die? Something here doesn't match. Of course, this is true. He is eternal, and for this reason, He's the only one who can offer His life as a sacrifice for sin, because He has the power to both lay down His life and take His life up again. But the crowd, you know, they don't understand this. They end up by questioning and doubting who Jesus declares He really is. In other words, they're saying, this isn't the Son of Man, the Messiah that we're looking for. We're not looking for a Messiah who dies. We're looking for a Messiah who lives, who's powerful, who can lead us out of poverty, who can break the yoke of Roman domination on it. That's the Messiah we want. You're talking about dying. Well, 
that's not the guy we want. So you hear the multitude's voice. So Jesus declares what he's going to do. The father confirms it. The multitude answer back, doubting. And then John. John takes over at the very end. Uh, he's the fourth voice we hear. And he explains Jesus' response to the doubts of the uh, multitude. He explains that their reaction to him was exactly what the prophets predicted about how the people would react to the Messiah, even with the signs and miracles performed. So the prophets said, you know, when the Messiah comes, you won't believe him. The prophets said, when the Messiah comes, he's going to do these miracles. And you know what? You still won't believe him. When the Messiah comes, he's going to do things that no man has ever done to prove that he's the Messiah. And you know what? You're still not going to believe him. And so their centuries of stubbornness and disobedience has made them unable to see, even when the plain proof was there. And this was predicted of them from the very beginning. So this section ends with the usual description by John of various individuals and groups. Uh, some believed, some disbelieved for a various uh, reasons. All right, one more section we're going to do and then we're going to close out for this lesson. Uh, and that is the warning, uh, the final part of this uh, chapter. Let's read beginning in 44. It says, and Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me does not, believe, does not believe in me, but in him who has sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So in this last section, Jesus offers a warning to everyone and to, uh, to everyone who has heard his words and seen the miracles. And here's the warning, twofold warning. First of all, if you reject me, you're rejecting God. And you know what? That hasn't changed. <laughs> that, 2,000 years hasn't. The ones who reject Jesus are in effect rejecting God. Whenever you hear, you know, Oh, it's all the same God. We're all the same God. You know, whether you believe in Buddha or this and that, you know, it's all the same God. No, it's not. Well, you're just being narrow-minded. No, I'm not. Jesus Himself said right here, if you reject me, then you are rejecting the one who sent me. And who sent him? Well, God sent him. God did not send two messiahs. He only sent one Messiah, and that Messiah said, part of your belief is the understanding that if, if you believe me, then you believe the one who sent me is God. But if you reject me, then you're also rejecting the one who sent me. Now you can name that God up there, you can give him all kinds of names, but there's only one God, and he's only sent one Messiah. You reject one, you reject the other. You accept one, you accept the other exclusively. Let's remember, Christianity is an exclusive religion. It's not a military religion like Islam. Islam is also, in a sense, a, an evangelistic religion, trying to make converts and so on and so forth. But in Islam, you, know, you will use the power of the state to, get to, to achieve your theological goals. Christianity isn't like that. Christianity is a proclaiming faith. We proclaim the gospel. Those who believe come and follow, and those who don't believe, well, they just don't believe. They stay in this world. We have no interest whatsoever in taking over governments and you know, imposing Christianity through secular means. Whereas in Islam, this is very much part of their religion and part of their history and culture and so on and so forth. All right, so there's the first warning. And then the second warning is the basis of judgment will be my word. Light and darkness actually refers to truth and knowledge and salvation and good 
uh, versus lies and ignorance and condemnation and evil. In other words, his words were God's words and believing and obeying them would be the basis for judgment and salvation. This is Jesus' final public appearance. And so he leaves the warning out there. If I ever doubt my salvation, and I have, you know, like everybody else, you ever doubt your salvation, you're saying, well, I don't know, but hmm, I'm not as good as I thought I was. And, the, and the, the longer I'm a Christian, the less good I, I realize that I am. I'm not so sure. Well, I'll tell you something. I don't care how I feel, because feelings have nothing to do with it. The only thing that determines whether I'm saved or not is what the Word says, not how I feel. Because if it was how I felt, there'd be plenty of days when I wouldn't be saved at all, period. Too much junk back there. Too much junk back there in my life reaching forward trying to just pull me away from faith. That's why our judgment is based on His word. I go to Acts 2.38 and it says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. It's pretty clear, you can't twist that to mean something else. Have I repented? Yes. Am I trying to obey Jesus? Yes. Have I been baptized? Yes. Well, therefore, are my sins forgiven? Yes. How do I know? Because the word says so. But how about the feeling of condemnation that I have sometimes? My conscience you know, telling me, you're not going to make it, you're not good enough. And then I go to Romans 8, chapter one, and it says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation? Well, there is none. But I'm not a perfect person. But the word says no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's paid the price. He's made restitution. I believe the word. And sometimes I have to believe the word against my own feelings. Against my own feelings. Everything that I feel tells me, eh, no, I'm not going to make it. That's why he says, It'll be, it'll be the word that judges. And I'm saying to you, the word not only judges, but it's the word that confirms and affirms and encourages us to remain faithful because Jesus' promises, our guarantees, are contained in black and white, right here. So he says in the end, you're with me, you're against me. You're a believer or you don't. You're in light or you're in darkness. You're saved or you're not saved. Whatever the category, the dividing line will always be the, what Jesus has said, not how you feel. You've heard the words, you've seen the miracles, deal with it. And so as it was then, so it continues today. We preach, we teach about His words and His miracles, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and all of mankind has to make up their mind. You believe or you don't believe. There are only two categories in the world, believers and non-believers. That's, that's all there is. That's, why, why do I say that? Am I being, again, narrow-minded? No, because that's how Jesus did it. There were only two categories. You're with me, you're a believer, or you're not with me, you're not a believer. Those are the two categories, the only ones that the Bible gives. Okay, we'll stop there, a good stopping point. You can pick this up in, the, uh, in, our, next, uh, in our next lesson. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>